as we're trying to do this both hybrid and online today. Um, but today I'm going to go over the laws and regulations updates uh, that are taking effect January 1st of uh, 2024. So that's more or less just over a month from now. Yeah, let me switch the slides. Okay, so today we're going to go over uh, definition changes. There's there's not a ton. There's a few definition changes. So I'll just um, mention some of those. Uh, we're going to talk about the private applicator certifications. So even though this doesn't necessarily um, impact your license license requirements as a dealer, um, these are things you're going to need to be aware of as a dealer when you're selling pesticides to people uh, that are restricted materials, both federally or uh, California restricted materials. Um, and what types of products you can actually sell them based on their, their new certifications. Uh, same with commercial applicators. So your QALs, QACs, uh, there's been some changes to categories and, and what um, products are, are under those uh, different categories now. Um, fumigant use changes. So pretty much all of the changes we're gonna, um, most of the changes that we're talking about today um, that are gonna impact you as the dealers are surrounding the use of fumigants. Uh, there is a little bit of changes regarding continuing education. I'm not really going to touch on that much, but I will um, show you guys the uh, the proposed regulations. Well, they're uh, now approved regulations. They are, you can find them on the approved and um, the pending and approved uh, new regulations that have come out on the DPR website. So we'll touch on that. But for those of you, I know dealers sometimes offer um, continuing education classes to uh, their, their customer base. And if you do that, uh, there are a significant number of changes that um, I'm going to have you mostly review that on your own. Um, but regarding especially online or um, virtual type trainings, uh, some of the requirements around that. Uh, so anyways, a lot of a lot of changes um, if you do offer continuing education courses to your your constituents. Um, dealer compliance changes. So there are uh, a few dealer compliance changes uh, that are going into effect as far as what you need for record keeping um, when you're selling products. And then we'll touch on a few other uh, requirements um, for dealers and PCAs that were already in existence, but just to, to review those one more time, uh, since a lot of your staff are probably pest control advisors writing recommendations and um, you are selling pesticides just to review those requirements with you. Okay, so uh, here's the first couple of definitions changes probably isn't going to impact um, too much interpretation of, of the law, uh, but if you are selling more to like landscape companies or things like that, these, these are probably going to apply. Um, the term incidental now means pest control that ensues from or is a minor consequence of a business's overall ornamental and turf maintenance activities. Pest control uh, separate from ornamental and turf plantings does not qualify. So this definition um, falls under some of the food and ag code. <clears throat> and so it's just more, um, some people may be doing pest control work in a incidentally as part of their other operations. And so um, that might be some like schools or or things like that, uh, that it's, or, or companies that are, you know, doing landscaping. Um, maybe they're primarily uh, landscape, landscaping business, but incidentally, a part, as part of that, they might do some minor um, pest control uh, applications. And then ornamental, ornamental means trees, shrubs, flowers, and other plantings intended primarily for aesthetic purposes in and around habitations, buildings, and surrounding grounds. Okay, so uh, I think that's fairly self-explanatory on, on the definition of ornamental. So these are just gonna um, be terms that may, when used in other parts of the code, uh, this is gonna be the more formal definitions. The term private applicator, okay? So the term private applicator is an individual who uses or supervises the use of a pesticide for the purpose of producing an agricultural commodity. Um, and then it's got lists the Title 40, which defines what ag commodities are. And hereby incorporated by reference, 
on property owned, leased, or rented by him or her or his or her employer. Now, there's an enforcement letter that just came out, I think, this past month from DPR to help people understand this. So if you are, um, if you have anyone that's um, a farm labor contractor, uh, you're not, the farm labor contractor themselves are not a property owner, unless they also happen to own um, their own uh, land or lease or rent land themselves. Um, but if, um, if you're a grower, you own your land or, or lease it, rent it yourself, your direct employees are eligible to take this private applicator exam. Your labor contractors, um, employees who are contracted to you are not. So, so you're probably going to um, see some changes in who uh, qualifies as a private applicator. Um, again, this is primarily going to be confusing, I think, for people who are um, farm management um, staff that are contracted as a labor contractor. So um, we're getting a lot of questions with this. As you know, there's been big changes to the private applicator licenses uh, and certifications. And so um, labor contractor employees are not eligible. So that, that's probably gonna be something that you're seeing down the road. You may have growers who have labor, labor contractor supervisors that primarily work on their property, um, but their certifications are not gonna be valid. Okay, then there's changes to the term certified commercial applicator. So a certified commercial applicator is someone like a QAL or a QAC, a German pilot or apprentice pilot, those, those state level licenses. However, um, QACs with just the category Q, which is our, your maintenance gardeners, they are a commercial applicator, right? They can do pest control work for hire, but they cannot possess restricted materials. And so these certified commercial applicators, again, are gonna be um, all your QA, QAL and QACs uh, that have categories other than category Q and your, your uh, juryman and apprentice pilot certificates, okay? So those are your certified people. Those are people that can possess restricted materials. The ones defined just as commercial applicators, so the other ones are commercial applicators, but um, commercial applicators may or may not be certified to possess restricted materials. And so category Q operators, those QAC category Q, your maintenance gardeners, um, they are licensed to do pest control work for hire, but they, uh, they do not possess the qualifications to um, have restricted materials. And so, um, it's kind of like a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square, that kind of a, a scenario. Okay, so let's go over the private applicator cert certificate changes. Okay, so if you have uh, any growers that are, their licenses are expiring, expiring at the end of this year, at, um, December 31st, 2023, that would be people whose last names fall between R and Z. They are still eligible if they get their uh, continuing education credits in before December 31st to renew their cards out to 2026, okay? So they can still renew this one time as long as they submit those requests for renewal before December 31st to extend their license out to 2026. However, beginning January 1st, um, that will not include the use of fumigants, okay? so. That old exam, um, anyone with the old certificate licenses will not include the use of fumigants. Okay, so people in A through H uh, that expires in 2024 next year, um, CE classes aren't going to really matter for them. Okay, unless um, until they've got the new uh, certificate exam, right? Then then they can start earning credits towards their the renewal of their new card. Uh, same through with same thing with anyone I through Q. Uh, their card is still going to expire in 2025. Um, any CE classes that they have is not going to count towards a renewal if they have the old certifications. However, once they get that new PAC certification, uh, then their CE credits will start counting towards the renewal of that new certification. Uh, you're probably going to be getting questions from your growers about, well, how do I study for these things? Uh, so the old, um, this kind of yellow handbook was the old 
pesticide safety um, private applicators reference manual. Uh, that is outdated, uh, is not current. So, um, I mean, they're welcome to look at it, but it, it won't be up to date. This third edition, this new version that uh, has a picture of uh, somebody reading the label and the, the boom sprayer down below, uh, that new third edition is now available um, for purchase from the UC Cooperative Extensions office. So they're located in um, the same building as us, uh, right next door um, where it says like the 4-H office, things like that. Uh, they can purchase those through the UC Cooperative Extensions or they can um, order it online from the UC, I think it's the a &R website, the Agricultural Natural Resources that uh, publish these, these documents. It's available that way. Um, I believe there's a pretty significant back order right now because pretty much every uh, private applicator is trying in the state is trying to study for and then retake this exam. Um, Stanislaus County has made these private applicator books available at all of our county libraries. And so uh, if your growers just want to study and they don't want to purchase the book, they can go to any of the Stanislaus County libraries and should be able to check one out. If they're all checked out, there should be at least one hard copy um, at, available at each branch location. All right, so the big change now is, um, so again, uh, these certificate cert certifications have changed because of some changes in the federal definition uh, related to cert certifying uh, restricted materials uh, um, handlers, especially in relation to fumigants. And so um, when California's uh, certification process got reviewed, the federal government determined that California needed to adjust their certification process slightly to reflect the federal changes. And so now um, anyone with a private applicator card, again, it is still valid until it expires this next round, but it will not include the use of fumigants. To be able to use a fumigant starting January 1st as a, as a private land um, owner or operator, you will need to pass first the new private applicator certificate. And if you pass that new private applicator certificate exam, then you're eligible to take this burring vertebrate pest fumigation certification. And so that would be a second exam. Uh, and if they pass that, then they will get a new, be issued a new card uh, to designate that new qualification. Um, the private applicator exam is still a 70 question exam. It's very similar to the old private applicator exam. Uh, you just need to pass with a 70% or more. If they don't pass that, that time, you know, pass, they just need to wait one week and they're eligible then to re retest. Okay. Uh, the burring vertebrate fumigant exam um, is 45 questions. And again, they need to pass that with a 70% or better uh, to get that um, burring vertebrate fumigant cer certificate. Uh, there's also a study manual for the burring vertebrate certificate um, fumigation exam available online on the DPR's website. So DPR uh, put this together. It's available for free. Um, they just need to either review it online or download and print their own copies for their study purposes. Uh, it is available in English and Spanish. All right, so use limitations, okay? So there's um, some new new things that have been repealed and, and um, amended. And then, so we had some past things that got repealed years ago and it's now back in effect. So restricted materials listed in section 6400. So again, those are your 6400 um, are your restricted material pesticides shall only be, be used by or under the direct super supervision of a certified private applicator or a commercial applicator. So that so either a PAC holder or a QAL, QAC. Operating within the scope of that individual certification. Okay, so what's changing here, it got repealed and now it's back in effect. It used to be that, hey, if I have a, um, a QAL in category A, I can come in and get my ag permit for my own personal property right, because I have a higher level license. But a QAL with category A is only for um, industrial type uses. It no longer include, it does not include uh, plant agriculture like category D would. 
And so uh, you can't come in and get your own private permit with a QAL category A because it is not within the scope of your certification. If you had the category D, yes, you could because that would be within the scope of your certification. Um, or they, you know, if it's your own private property, you could also get a private applicator certificate, and that would cover cover the scope of that use. Um, we're going to get into the different categories here in a little bit, but uh, fumigations are going to be what's primarily affected by this because all the previous uh, categories that people had in possession no longer include the use of fumigants, and there's two new additional categories, L and M that are gonna be for the use of fumigants. And so um, this is gonna impact people with, with um, the need to use fumigants. We won't be able to issue them a permit unless it's a pest control business only permit unless they, um, for, for the use of fumigants, unless they have the proper certifications. So that means they would need to have category L if they're doing soil fumigations, category M if they're doing any kind of other um, fumigants. So that could be rodent control, uh, stockpiles, uh, yeah, other commodity type treatments, um, or have a, a private applicator certificate with that BVF certification uh, for the use of uh, aluminum phosphide or magnesium phosphide for the purpose of rodent control. Okay, um, an individual who is certified as a private or commercial applicator, but does not possess the category branch or type of certification required for the intended use shall operate under the direct supervision of a certified or, uh, commercial applicator whose categories and scope of certification are applicable to the intended use. Okay, so if you have somebody else on your staff that um, has those certifications, they would be responsible for the use of those fumigants. So if you're um, you know, the owner of the company but don't have the right certifications anymore, but your staff does, uh, your staff member would be responsible for the use of those those products, and we want, would want to make sure they got listed on the permit um, to as a responsible party for the use of fumigants. Um, except as provided in D, so that's below, uh, a restricted material which bears labeling designating the product as a fumigant shall only be used under the direct supervision of a certified applicator. So again, somebody with that category L, M, or if it's private property, um, that vertebra, um, burrowing vertebrate fumigant category. Private applicators certified in accordance with this section may use or provide direct supervision for the use of restricted materials bearing labeling designating the product as a fumigant for the control of bur burrowing pests. So anyways, so a lot of changes about who is considered certified uh, and we actually have to have someone certified in all the right categories. That's the take home message here. Okay, uh, here's just a picture of uh, the new certification cards, those private applicator certification cards. And so um, you'll see that there's uh, that at the bottom of that certificate, it now says burring vertebrate pest fumigation certificate, and it should be marked either yes or no. Uh, and then on the back side of the card, um, the Ag Commissioner's Office now has to certify that they've passed both of those exams. So private applicant, if it only has a signature where it says private applicator certifi cer certified, um, a signature will only be in the top box. But if they've also passed that burring vertebrate fumigant exam, there should be a, a second signature on that second line there. Uh, so the front should reflect the same as the back. In Stanislaus County, um, we are trying to help make this a little easier to, to determine aside from um, marking the proper categories, the uh, private applicator certificates with the burning vertebrate fumigate certificate added on. Uh, we're giving out a blue colored card now. Um, anyone who hasn't passed that one is still going to get kind of that beige-ish colored card. And so you'll you'll probably see some new colors coming in, um, but we've we've done that mostly to help color to color code and make it a little quicker to identify. Um, who's certified in the right categories, so. Okay, so our first question, so um, part of the new uh, requirements that we have uh, as if you look through the, the new regulations that came out, um, when doing online virtual meetings like we're doing today, we're required to do polling questions. And so um, we're gonna go over our first polling question right now. Uh, and we 
we'll be logging um, the participation in that. So uh, our first question, private applicator certificate holders will need to comply with and pass the revised PAC exam and burrowing vertebrate fumigation exam prior to applying fumigants for rodent control by what date? January 1st, 2024, December 31st, 2024, or only after their next, uh, after their PAC expires, depending on your last name. So it looks like the majority of you are saying A. Okay, let me just close that. Okay, so A is the correct answer. This is gonna have to click on it. There we go. So A is the correct answer. Okay, why is it doing all these? I did not add that in there. So we got a little fun uh, <laughs> actions built in there, um, but January 1st. So again, just a, about a, a little over a month away. Okay, oh my goodness. Okay, I, I we've been giving this presentation a lot, so sorry, I, I didn't build that in there and I didn't realize that these actions were in there. So um, anyways, commercial applicator category changes. Okay, so these are your QALs, QACs. Okay, so these subcategories that we had previously are now going to be eliminated. So uh, before there was a category L for wood preservation, that no longer exists. Category N for anti-fouling tributylin type paints, that is now gone. Uh, category N for sewer line and root control no longer is, exists. Um, category O for field fumigations, that doesn't exist anymore. And category P for microbial pest control, which we usually see in like wineries with um, wine barrels and corks and things like that, that no longer exists, okay? All of these categories now need are going to be um, encompassed within um, a different one of these new categories. So L is going to, the new category L is going to be for soil fumigation. So things like telone, chloropicrin, methyl bromide, vapam, kpam, um, that's all going to go into the soil fumigation category. Okay, non-soil fumigations are going to include things like that vertebrate rodent control, right? Because even though you're putting um, those tablets into the ground, the intent is actually to kill the rodent, not treat the soil. So um, that'll be included in that. Uh, commodity fumigations are usually um, another very common use of fumigants. So anything that's not a direct treatment of the soil, but is the use of a fumigant will now fall under category M. Okay, so the these new category definitions, so category L is so uh, soil fumigations to control soil pests, um, aka filled, so uh, filled soil fumigations, using a pesticide labeled as a fumigant, uh, and again, metam, potassium, chloropicrin, telone, all those things are going to fall under that. Uh, Non-soil fumigations are going to be on-farm commodity fumigations, um, people using um, pesticide li labels as a fumigant. fumigant. Uh, these are going to be things like aluminum phosphide, phosphine products, um, sulfuryl fluoride, and in some situations, methyl bromide for people needing that for um, export certifications. Uh, there are new study materials now out for these um, two new categories, category L and category M, um, and they're now available uh, for purchase. Okay, so uh, there's some some you could you could refer to the DPO website under these new categories that that lists um, what those new study manuals are, and uh, and access the that information that way. It looks like on here is um, they're published by the University of California, so you could go to the UC ANR website to to access and purchase these books. And it looks like they're also available as an e-book, so a digital copy as well. Okay, so again, um, for people if they're ready for their exams, uh, you're going to have to fill out that new application process. I've been talking to some of our uh, nut companies who recently were working on getting their certifications. Um, 
I know one person got it, uh, you know, sent in their application and got a testing date within six weeks. However, uh, a couple other people they work with from the same company who smelled it about the same time haven't got theirs yet. And so it may be a little longer than six weeks, just depending on, I think probably they're having a, a huge number of requests for these exams. Now they're getting an email and it will be received from this no reply at psiexams.com. Um, from what I understood from um, the gal I talked to was she was given like a kind of a seven, like the next week she had about two to seven days um, with three exam location options. Um, one of them was here in Modesto. Uh, the other two were like in Fresno Clovis area. And you went to that testing site and I think it's a digital type test. And you know, uh, right at the time that you um, finish, whether you passed or failed. So that's kind of a relief. Um, and she said she passed, but um, she said that it looked like it would also offer you the ability to possibly reschedule if you didn't pass. So uh, anyways, that's kind of what it's going to look like. You're going to get those um, some kind of an email from them. Okay. So poll question number two, which of the following are considered certified commercial applicators? So again, the keyword here is certified commercial applicator. Is it a qualified applicator um, with only subcategory Q? I'm going to close this because um, it's I can't read my questions. So hopefully you guys can keep seeing it online. Um, QELs, holders, QAC holders with subcategory Q. Qualified applicator uh, license holders with categories A and D. Or private applicator holders. Which ones are considered certified commercial applicators? So the keywords here are certified, but also commercial. Okay. Is everyone participating in the poll, Claudia? And what was the answer everyone's putting? Everybody's saying qualified applicator license slash certificate holder. With which categories? Um, category A and B. Yeah. So let's get this to change slides here. So yeah, so it would be that... Um, Qualified applicator license or, or certificate holder, right? Because that means they're a commercial applicator. But categories A and D allow for the use of restricted materials, whereas category Q does not, right? So, so they're considered certified uh, re um, restricted materials um, applicators based on that new definition. Okay, fumigant use changes. Okay, so... Uh, Category L, soil fumigation. So again, um, I know this is a little redundant, but we want to kind of make sure these are the big changes that, that you're aware of and hits home. So, um, so category L, soil fumigations, they pre perform pest control using pesticides labeled as a fumigant to control soil pests, including fields, forests, golf courses, greenhouses, uh, and individual tree or vine holes, okay? So this does not include category M. So if you have a category L, this doesn't allow you to do the vertebrate pest control. It does not allow you to do stockpiles. This is solely for the purpose of, of fumigating a soil, whether that be um, a potting soil or, or you know, the so native soil, um, okay? Uh, category M, this allows you to perform pest control using a pesticide labeled as a fumigant too. Uh, fumigate enclosed areas under tarpaulin covered structures and commodities, vaults, chambers, greenhouses, vans, boxcars, ships, planes, and vehicles containing agricultural commodities for post harvest fumigation, or non food, non feed materials, including but not limited to pallets, dunnage, furniture, burlap bags, uh, planting mediums, including potting soil, potting mix, wine barrels, and corks. Uh, fumigant pest burrow sites, um, but not limited to fields, rights away, ditches, landscaping, and equipment yards, okay? And fumigant um, sewer lines, so in, you know, service to utility poles or other fumigations not covered under the category L, okay? Again, this does not include structural pest control, which is required under Chapter 4, uh, which would be... Uh, you would be certified under the structural board. 
Okay, and then some other category reminders. So again, uh, this is the new definitions of category A. You'll notice that it does not include the use of any pesticide label as a fumigant. Okay, so that was the residential, industrial, and institutional pest control category. B was landscape maintenance pest control. This again does not now include the use of any product labeled as a fumigant. Same with C, rights of way. No longer includes anything used or uh, labeled as, as a fumigant. Uh, D, agricultural pest control, right? This no longer includes the use of fumigants. Category E, forest pest control. So it no longer includes the use of fumigants. Uh, category G, regulatory pest control. Uh, this would be your government offices like, like myself. Um, we are no longer able to do anything, apply anything labeled as a fumigant under category G. Seed treatments no longer includes fumigants. Uh, category I, which is your animal um, agricultural pest control, again, does not include the use of fumigants. Uh, J, which is your demonstration or research, right? Un University of California people. Uh, doing research. Category J no longer includes the use of a fumigant. Uh, K for health-related pest control uh, no longer includes the use of fumigants. Okay, so again, all of these categories have now been repealed, right? So um, it's possible that people with QAL or QAC licenses that aren't going to be renewed until 2024 will still have um, these categories listed on their card. But again, come January 1st, those have all been repealed and are no longer uh, no longer exist as of January 1st. Okay, um, so here's kind of just a little table trying to figure out what you need, right? So if you're a private applicator, um, you know, if you're not using a fumigant, you're still okay with your old uh, certification until it expires. Once that expires, you'll need to retest and re-exam, examine and then pass the, the new private applicator exam at that point. Um, but as long as you don't need fumigants, uh, you can continue to operate with just a private applicator certificate. Come January 1st, if you need to use a fumigant, uh, these private applicators will need to take that new burrowing vertebrate fumigant exam, pass the, the PAC exam first, and then add on that additional burrowing vertebrate fumigant exam, okay? Uh, starting January 1st, anyone doing any kind of a, with a commercial applicator license that intends to do fumigations will now need the category L or category M. Okay. Uh, all right. So here's the big thing for you guys, some de dealer compliance changes. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So here's, uh, these are, will go into effect January 1st. Okay. So each licensed pest control dealer shall not sell or deliver a pesticide when the requirements of the registered label conflict with the requirements of that label or, or with a pest control recommendation. So if you have a PCA that wrote a recommendation, you can't sell them something uh, that deviates from that recommend, recommendation, right? Uh, unless they're purchasing something without a rec. Um, you can't knowingly sell or deliver a registered pesticide for a use not shown in the labeling or when any condition of use shown in the labeling cannot be complied with and sell or deliver a pesticide listed as uh, in section 6400, which is those restricted materials, uh, a certified private or commercial applicator license whose categories or scope of certification do not allow for the intended pesticide use. So the first part of that was already in existence, right? Um, but what's been, um, what's new about this is you now are responsible for making sure that whoever you're selling to it to has the proper certifications, right? And the proper categories. It used to be, oh, they have a QAC, a QAL, they have the higher level license, they can handle restricted materials, we could sell it to them. But that got amended back on um, with this, these changes. And now you need to make sure, again, those proper categories um, are covered. Okay, so poll question number three. After January 1st of 2024, can fumigant products be sold to a QAL or QAC holder employed by a pest control business? Let me close that again. Employ employed by a pest control business only certified in categories A and D. 
and why, okay? So can you sell a fumigants to people with uh, employed by somebody with and only have categories A and D? So A, yes, they are certified commercial, a certified commercial applicator. B, no, they are not a certified commercial applicator. Or C, no, they are not a certified commercial applicator with the categories L and M. Does everyone participate in the poll? Okay. So no, um, they are a certified commercial applicator, but you can't sell them a fumigant because they don't have the new fumigant categories, L or N, depending on um, what type of fumigation they're doing. Okay. Okay, dealer records and sales reporting. So again, this is um, some of the new omitted information. Let me move this little button here because it's in my way. Oops, I want to go back. There we go. I'm going to slide this over. Top. Okay. So each licensed pest control dealer shall prepare and maintain records of all pesticides sold or delivered, except for pesticides labeled only for home use. For each transaction, these records shall include the following. The purchaser's name and address for any pesticide listed uh, in section 6400, so that's your restricted materials. The purchaser's name must include the name of the business or agency or operator of the property if applicable, right? So if you're getting a permit and you're um, selling it to uh, a business name, right? ABC Farms, you shouldn't be listing uh, your cells as just being sold to John Smith, right? The, the certified person. You need to actually list the operator of the property, which will be listed on the permit that it was sold to ABC Farms. And then you need to also list, because it says and, and the name of the certified private or commercial applicator purchasing the restricted material. So if that is John Smith, then you would also need to list John Smith as the certified applicator, okay? If the purchase is made by a non-certified agent, right? So if John Smith, the certified guy, has um, sends in one of his foremen to come purchase products for, on his behalf, then you now also need to list the name of that non-certified agent and record um, also, so record the name of the individual who made the purchase and the address of that person, which may, may be the residence or the business address, right? So. Um, I think some of this has been happening because we've been seeing um, a lot of changes or a lot of, lot of things that have come up where non-certified people have come in and picked up product and it never actually went to uh, the business or the certified operator. Um, I've seen it more, I think, in the landscaping world where um, people, you know, maybe a supervisor that worked for a landscape company became a familiar face coming in and picking up product on behalf of the landscaper, um, but then decided, you know what, I could do this on my own. I could do my own little side gig of uh, doing landscape maintenance on my own. And then they end up with products like aluminum phosphide uh, and they're using it for like gopher control or something in and around homes, which is definitely not what we want happening. Um, but what happens is, you know, the property operator or the certified agent uh, may not be updating with their dealers those new non-certified people who are allowed to purchase for them. And so if you start beginning to see a familiar face all the time, um, you know, we, we, we get a little complacent with going, oh, okay, yeah, they work for this guy, but they may not anymore. And so we now need you to record that because um, that means that person probably bought, came in and purchased it falsely. Clicking. <clears throat> okay, there we go. Okay, the dealer um, sales reporting also has to have the product name and US EPA number uh, on there. So um, you can't just put that, you know, you sold them Roundup Power Max. You need to actually have the EPA number listed on there as well. Um, if you're selling something that has a Section 18 like Casimin, you need to also list that emergency exemption number. Um, that is issued by the states. So uh, whenever they amend these products onto their permits, they should be getting like a, a 
exemption label um, that's with a with that section 18 number listed on it, you'll need to record that on the sales records. Um, same thing for anything with a special local need number. Okay, polling question number four. After January 1st, 2024, which the following is not a required re requirement of pesticide dealers must maintain a record of when selling restricted materials. So which of the following is not required? Uh, that a purchaser's business property operator name and their certified applicator's name be on the record. Um, that you um, need to include the intended use of the product by the purchaser the name of the non-certified agent making the purchase, or the product's name, EPA number, or special local need, uh, section 18 number. Okay. All right, so it looks like the majority of you are saying B. And so B is the correct answer. You don't need to put the intended use of the product, but you do need to list, again, that purchaser's uh, business or operator name and their certified applicator's name, the name of any non-certified applicator making the purchase, and again, uh, all those EPA, product EPA numbers, special local needs, Section 18 numbers, those are all now required. Okay, and then these are um, regulations that were already in existence, um, and, and I've also included within that because the regulations were updated, um, the new ones too. So we're just going to review the overall requirements and not just the ones that were updated, okay? So for dealers, for the sale of a non-restricted material, okay, on your sales records, you need to have the purchaser's name and address, the product name and EPA number, or that section 18 or special local need number, the date of the purchase, the operator identification number. So that's, we call a permit number, but technically if it's a non-restricted permit, it would be their operator identification number. And so um, it may be the restricted materials permit number. It may be the operator ID number. Um, but that number, that permit number, or a statement that one was not required. Uh, pest control recommendation number or statement that one was not provided. The de delivery location, name of the person or business receiving the product if it's delivered by the dealer. Right, so where did, who did you deliver it to and where? And the sales records shall be maintained at the dealer's office for two years and available to the Act Commissioners um, or, or to the DPR uh, for review during that time. If you're selling a restricted material, okay, you still need to have the name of the business uh, agency or um, operator purchasing the product and their address. Additionally, you need to have the name of the certified or um, private or commercial applicator purchasing that product. And if that purchase is made by a non-certified agent, you need to include their name and address as well. Uh, again, the product name and EPA numbers, um, Section 18 special local need numbers all need to be listed. Still need to have the date of the purchase. Uh, you need to have that permit number or a statement that one was not required. Uh, have that pest control recommendation number listed or a statement that one was not provided. And you still need to have the delivery location and name of the person that you delivered it to if it was delivered by the dealer. And then again, all of these records still need to be maintained for two years and available to the Ag Commissioner's Office or um, DPR upon request. Okay. Other dealer responsibilities here. So each licensed pest con control dealer that sells a restricted material which requires a permit for use or possession, shall before the sale or delivery obtain a copy of the permit, okay? So just make sure, um, I think this is where, you know, there's so much paperwork because you're dealing with lots of counties and you have growers that in, are in multiple counties, make sure you're getting a copy of the permit for each county that, that, that you're selling product to them for, okay? And um, I know some people are doing, you know, still the hard copy printed and stuck in a file. Other dealers um, for compliance I see are starting to keep like a centralized permit, um, like file on their, on their servers or something that everybody has access to. Um, so there's different ways to be compliant with this. It doesn't have to be a physical hard copy, but at the, during the time of inspection, it needs to be available and presented at that time. Okay, it can't be something that you have to go obtain 
Um, if you can't find it in-house before inspections are done, that means you probably weren't um, able to, you either didn't have a copy or it wasn't filed properly and it won't, we weren't able to locate it during the inspection. So, so make sure you have those available um, when, when you're inspected. Okay. Um, a restricted material specified as a 6400A, so federally restricted use pesticide or, or um, a groundwater protection material, right? So simazine, diuron, some of those products um, that have the potential to pollute the groundwater. Uh, that does not require a permit for possession or use, shall be sold or delivered only to a certified private or commercial applicator, right? So even if they don't need a permit, it still has to be, those products have to be sold to somebody with a, um, the proper certifications, okay? Uh, for applications to tribal lands, this is the part that kind of got updated, uh, an individual certified by a tribe or the U.S. EPA is considered a certified applicator under U.S. EPA approved certification plan. So um, probably isn't going to apply to you unless you're selling to a tribal affiliation or um, like a federal government type facility, right? So if you're selling to the, the National Park Service or something, then this might apply. Okay. Uh, the dealer shall, before seller delivery, obtain from the purchaser a copy of his or her um, certi cert certification. So whether it's a private applicator cert certificate or QAL, QAC license, um, and a signed statement with the following information or something substantially similar. Okay, so I usually just advise you, um, I know people have asked me, well, where do you get this form? You don't, it's in code and you can put it on your own letterhead. Um, but I, I, I would advise cutting this code directly out so you know you're in compliance. And it would say, I am a certified applicator authorized by the scope of my, and that would be private applicator certificate, QAL, QAC, uh, and then list their license number and the date it was issued. Uh, to use restricted materials, I am purchasing. My certificate is valid until, and then the date that it expires. My categories relevant to this pesticide, uh, pesticide's use are, and then this is where you can check their qualifications. Are they a QA? Um, or do they have category A or D? Um, do they have the new L or M? Um, if they have the new BVF certification, right? So they, they can list that there. And then the name of the business agency or operator of the property that I am employed by, if applicable. Okay, prior to the sale or delivery of pesticides listed um, under these sections, the uh, so six, section 6622, the operator of the property um, or their authorized representative, um, the dealer shall obtain from the purchaser a copy of their restricted materials permit showing all operator identification numbers, so all their sites. Uh, if the purchaser has such a permit or a copy of the form issued uh, to an operator of the property pursuant um, section 6622. So um, those kind of exceptions. So again, basically, this is just saying that you need to, um, prior to selling uh, pesticides, you need to have a copy of those restricted materials permits with all their, their sites listed, right? So if you have an amendment in the middle of the year and that site is not listed, you need to get that amendment, okay? So it's not just the permit as a whole, it's those individual sites as well, right? Those operator identified sites. Uh, the dealer shall send a list of the operator identification numbers or permit numbers, right, with corresponding names of the purchase uh, person's purchasing pesticides during the quarter within 10 days following the end of each quarter of the calendar year to each commissioner who issued the numbers. The dealer is not required to send the list to the commissioner uh, within the county that the dealer is located. So this is that out-of-county sales reports, okay? So... Um, this is where you want to make sure, especially you have growers in multiple counties, uh, you're going to have different county permits. So you want to make sure that you don't accidentally um, sell under the wrong permit number because then you're also going to be end up being in violation of not doing your out-of-county sales reports because, um, you know, if someone's in Stanislaus County, has a Stanislaus County permit and a Merced County permit, uh, and they purchase something under the Merced County permit, you're going to be required to notify Merced County of that purchase. Okay, the dealer shall retain for two years a copy of each um, permit and, or signed statement that the pesticide purchaser um, provided to the dealer, right? So either that statement that they fill out saying that, you know, a uh, permit was not required, but these are my certifications, 
or a copy of those permits. All of those need to be kept uh, for two years. Okay, now I'm gonna to touch on some PCA requirements, okay? So um, these are basically the main elements that we inspect when we're doing a PCA audit, which we usually do um, during a, a dealer audit kind of simultaneously, unless they're an independent PCA. So um, these are under the food and ag code. So this is a law, not a regulation. Uh, so no person shall act or offer to act as an ag agricultural uh, pest control advisor without first having secured um, a PCA license from the director, so from DPR. Uh, officials of federal, state, and county departments of agriculture and the University of California personnel engaged in their official duties relating to agricultural use are exempt from this. So, so if you're Roger Duncan um, with the UC, um, Depart you know, UC Cooperative Extension's office, he technically does not need a PCA license um, because he's affiliated with the University of California, okay? Uh, and, and as long as he's working within his official capacities. Um, if any recommendation by any of these persons uh, as to specific application on a specific parcel is made, uh, they need to be made in writing, okay? So anyways, that's that part. Basically, you can't just be, um, you wanna make sure your staff, especially if they're working at the front counters or something, are not giving out PCA type advice, right? Because if they're not a PCA, they can't be giving that advice out. They can assist them with sales or things like that, but they shouldn't be offering um, some kind of a specific advice for the applications to their properties. Okay. Uh, no person shall act or offer to act as a uh, PCA in any county wherein uh, he makes recommendations for an agricultural use without first registering with the Ag Commissioner's Office. So again, if you're a PCA, uh, make sure to register with each county that you're writing uh, recommendations for. Agricultural Pest Control Advisors shall put all um, recommendations um, concerning agricultural use in writing. So um, you need to also make sure that this is written, right? So any advice that you're giving to your growers, it needs to be written as a recommendation. And one copy of each written recommendation shall be signed and dated and shall be furnished to the operator of the property prior to the application. Um, where a pesticide use is recommended, a copy shall also be furnished to the dealer and the applicator prior to purchasing the application. So if you're a PCA within your own company, um, obviously you want to make sure your own staff is aware of that. Um, if you're writing recs for somebody um, and you're not sure where they're going, um, make sure maybe give them a second copy so they can provide that to, to their dealer. Uh, each written recommendation shall include, when applicable, the following information. The name and dosage of each pesticide to be used or a description of method um, recommended, the identity of each pest to be controlled, the, op the owner or operator of uh, the property and location uh, and acreage to be treated, the commodity crop or site to be treated, uh, the su suggested schedule, time, or conditions for the pesticide application or other um, control method, a warning of the possibility of damages when the pesticide application that reasonably should have been known by the PCA exists, uh, the signature and address of the person making the recommendation with the date and the name of the business um, that that person represents. So if you're working for a dealer, you also need to list the name of, of the dealership you're working for and any other information that the director may require. Uh, PCAs and um, pest control operators shall retain one copy of each written recommendation for one year following the date of that recommendation uh, and a copy of the recommendation, again, should be make, made available to the Ag Commissioner's Office upon request. So um, all those recs that are written, it's only required by regulation to be maintained and, and kept on file for one year. Okay. Uh, it shall be unlawful for any PCA to make recommendations in a category for which he is not certified. Okay. So if you're not certified for vertebrate pest control, um, when we're going through and looking at your recs, we don't want to see anything that is for some kind of a vertebrate pest control. Um, so I think a majority of our PCAs um, have pretty much all the categories, but a lot of times newer PCAs are just getting started or still working on getting all those categories. So um, again, just pay attention, um, especially with 
uh, fumigants. I see sometimes the soil fumigations, not everyone, that's one that's less commonly possessed by everybody. So, so just make sure you're staying within your own categories uh, related to your recommendations. Okay. Uh, no recommendation shall be in conflict with the registered labeling for the product being recommended. Um, this did come up very often, um, but it, we've started to see kind of an uptick with some of these um, errors that are happening um, with PCAs. And probably because it's not always caught by the um, systems that you're using, like Agrian or CDMS, et cetera. Um, but what we're kind of finding is that, um, especially with high VOC products, right? You write the rec uh, in April, right, uh, for goal. And your application period, your list, you know, maybe your standard put it out for two weeks, but you wrote it at the end of April and it rolls into May, right? And where we're finding it usually is on the application end where we go and inspect the grower and we're like, hey, it's May 2nd, you know, you're going at a too high of a rate. Let me see your, your recommendation. And then we realize like, well, they're following the recommendation, but that recommendation was initially written in April and it rolled into May. And so um, once you hit May 1st to the end of October, those high VOC regs kicks in. And so um, there could be some conflict with, with, with um, things like that. Okay, um, this past year, we've had some really bad bee kills um, over, you know, affecting multiple beekeepers. Um, and so I know one application this year um, was for a product um, to control thrips and peaches. And uh, the recommendation had all the nice little fluffy things in there like, hey, this product is toxic to bees. Make sure to do a bee kill a check within 48 hours. Um, but if you actually read through the label and check the stone fruit section, it says, do not apply this product to stone fruit while it's in bloom. And the time period that was on that recommendation was right at the peak of the bloom season. And so really that's a, a, a rec written against the label. And as a result, you know, the, the growers a lot of times are just reading off these prescriptions basically that you're writing as a rec and they're putting it out and reported we had hundred thousand over $100,000 in loss from just two beekeepers impacted by this it was pretty much a total loss for them it was i've never seen bee kills like this before um but in reality in our surveillance you know not all the beekeepers reported anything a lot of them you know are like well i don't i'm not even going to bother with it there's no good in it um but really i would estimate where there's probably over a half a million dollars of losses of bees just based on that one recommendation so so really make sure um you're checking labels especially these products that are toxic to bees they're really confusing and it takes us a while to read through it because there'll be that nice big B statement up at the very beginning under usually under the environmental sections with the nice little pictogram of the B and it gives you all these procedures for minimizing um, B losses like apply at night, uh, do your recs, um, things like that. But there may be even stricter parts of the label in the crop sections and elsewhere in the label that are like, do not apply this. Uh, when it's during this growth stage. And so really make sure you don't just quickly skim through that B section because sometimes even though that there's some mitigation measures in there that you can meet, the crop sections might be much stricter. So um, that would be my tip um, with PCAs is really read some of these labels, especially with VOCs and um, B products, even fumigants for that matter, right? Because they're a little more complex. Okay, recommendation criteria, I think that says criteria, yeah. Um, so in addition to the requirements of uh, the section 1203, um, so 12,003, uh, recommendations shall also include the total acreage or units to be treated, the concentration or volume per acre of the units, uh, worker reentry intervals, um, pre-harvest intervals or pre-slaughter inter intervals, uh, label restrictions on use or disposition of the treated commodity or byproducts, okay? Um, criteria used for determining the need for the recommendation. So um, how did you go out and evaluate this need? Uh, certification that alternatives and mitigation measures that would subsa substantially lessen any significant adverse impact on the environment have been considered and if feasible adopted. Uh, in addition, the recommendation shall designate the pest um, by accepted common name. Okay, so 
Uh, a lot of this is kind of pre-programmed in some of your reporting systems, but, but just double check um, that all of these are included. Okay, uh, final polling question. So pest control advisory recommendations must not include the name and rate of the pesticide to be applied, include the name of the common commodity to be treated, uh, conflict with the registered label of the product recommended, or conflict with the property operator's requests. So which of the following is the correct answer? Okay. And has everyone participated in the poll, Claudia? Just about. Okay, so again, we got to make sure we're participating in these also to get credits because starting next year, if you don't, you're not going to get credits for these online type classes. Okay, so make sure to respond. Oops. Okay, so again, um, you're not required. Uh, so pest control advisors recommendations must not conflict with a registered pesticide label. Okay. Um, so this is just some little updates from our office. Um, we're offering a lot of private applicator review sessions followed by a test. Um, we have, I think um, the next testing date is December 2nd. Uh, that will be here at our facilities. Um, and we'll be starting at 10 o'clock in the morning and going to about noon or slightly after noon with the review. And then uh, they can take the test immediately after. Uh, and we have dates all the way out to January 18th right now. We will be working on getting some new testing dates scheduled for next year, okay? So um, if you need this flyer, it's available on our website. Please share that with your growers because we're trying to get the information out to them as best as possible. We're having a very high passing rate. Um, I think we're like in the 80% overall on passing. Um, I think it's even higher for the English exam than that. So really high passing rates. Most people that don't pass typically pass on the second go around, at least from what I've observed. Um, people are struggling a little bit more with the Spanish versions of the exam. Um, and when we're working with the state to help kind of maybe improve that process um, for the Spanish test takers. Uh, but anyways, uh, please help us get the word out. We rely on dealers a lot to help us with communication. Okay. Um, there's more regulatory information um, available online. So I'm gonna jump out of this screen. Um, we could take some questions and um, that kind of wraps up the CE part of it. I'm gonna stay on for a few questions here for everybody. And I wanna show you a couple of things that are available online. Um, so I'm gonna slide this down. <clears throat> Oops, it's presenter screen. Okay. So um, just to keep updated with new regulatory changes, right? Uh, so let me go back a page here. So there's the DPR website right here. That's, um, let's slide this up. So um, on DPR's website under um, their rules and regulations, uh, they list all the proposed and recently adopted regulations. So as you can see, there's a lot of new proposed regulations coming out surrounding everything from the statewide notification system to neonicotinoids, um, civil penalty rates, um, groundwater issues, uh, decontamination sites, that one's kind of a, a minimal one, um, VOCs and telone, right? So lots of new things coming out and changes. So I, I advise you to check this website out periodically to stay up to date on those changes. Um, today, I'm just gonna show you where um, these changes that we've reviewed today are. So it's going to be under this DPR 22-03-003 uh, that says certification and training. Um, if you go to that webpage, you can actually access the newest um, proposed text or not proposed because it's going to affect. So right, if you scroll all the way down here, it says final text of regulations and you can open that up and you can print this out and review it for yourselves or with your staff. Um, so as you look through it, anything underlined is new. Anything struck out is all is was part of the old regulation and got removed. Most of the strikeouts are related to just like some grammatic changes with the insertions of these new changes um, or clarifying some terminology. Yeah, do we have a question? Yeah. Um, can you go over the new pesticide use reporting uh, timing and date? Yes. So let's scroll down to that section. It's pretty far down here. So 
there's a lot covered under this section of new regs. So a lot's definitions, a lot of it's these new certification requirements, a huge section is dedicated just to the CEs and how CEs are gonna be operated. Um, but there are those dealer updates. And then let me scroll way down here. I think it's at the towards the very bottom, um, but there's some on pesticide use reports. Let's just pull up this. Like I said, there's a lot in here. So I encourage you. So this is all the dealer section is down here towards the bottom. The use reporting's past that. Oops. Let me grab that. Outside use records, right? So six, section 6624, okay? So I know a lot of PCAs um, help their growers with pesticide use reports, okay? Um, there's gonna be some changes on what's required. There's not much, as you can see, it's just those underlying sections. But in addition to the date of application, right? Before it just said date of application. Now it says date and time of the application that is, needs to be on the use report. Um, I think if I scrolled it, I mean, sorry, I'm on a split screen here, so. And under that, there's it specifies here. Just it used to say just hour the treatment was completed. Okay, it used to just be the hour the treatment was completed was the requirement. The new um, requirement is that you these use reports include the date and time the treatment started and ended. Okay, so if you started an application at eight and finished at ten, you need to include the date and that the start time was eight o'clock and the end time was ten o'clock in the morning. Right, so. Um, and so now you just need to have that start time and the end time. Okay. So that's, that's the big change right there. Okay. And then you also need to include the method of application. So how was this product applied? Was it a ground rig? Was it a uh, fumigation, you know, injection? Was it hand applied? Whatever it is, but the method of application. Okay. <clears throat> I know that's a lot more work for you guys, but from us doing a lot of these investigations, this is very helpful for us. Um, I think there's a lot of room for error with this because growers don't always, I think, communicate to you guys properly um, what their start and end times are. So they're going to need to be better at this. This is a requirement of the grower. Okay. PCAs don't have to do pesticide use reports for them, but I know you guys do this as a courtesy to your growers. So um, most of the time they're throwing you guys under the bus of permit renewal season when they don't have their use reports in. Okay. So um, but make sure, you know, to probably communicate this out, that there's some changes and that you need them to be communicating with you much better than maybe they already have been. Okay. Any other questions regarding this, these changes? Okay. So again, all these proposed regulations are here. I encourage you to print it out, read through the changes, maybe skim through the sections that don't apply to you. If you're not offering CE credits and stuff like that, that you probably don't need to read through that, but that part's really bulky. Uh, I think this is like 39 pages long of new, well, existing regs infused with the new regs, but um, some of it will be applicable to you, some of it will not be. Yeah. I have another question. If a dealer submits the QR with inaccurate date and time, what kind of liability falls on the dealer? Probably none. <laughs> it's probably all going to go back to the grower. And that's where the frustration is a little bit with our office is because I know you guys are doing the best you can with the information you're provided, but then the grower ends up arguing with us. And we're like, well, this is what, this is what you submitted. So you need to make sure your information is accurate. Right. And so um, it's ultimately the grower's responsibility because you're submitting it on their behalf. My advice, I would recommend that PCAs don't submit recommendations unless you know that you're getting proper information from them because um, at the end of the day, there's going to be this a lot of back and forth um, related to these things, especially when incidences come up, and most likely you probably wouldn't be won't want to be in the middle of all that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, Judith wanted me to share this with you guys. Um, so there's some new new nicotinoid regs coming out. Um, this website, which uh, just came out, I think either yesterday or today, um, was sent out to us, and so there's all these little. Let me try to scroll down better. There's some new little fact sheets related to the different commodities in relation to 
uh, these neonicotinoid regulations. So um, it's now available. Um, if I'm going to send back out to all the, the dealerships that this invitation for this training um, got sent to with this new link. Um, but I would recommend that you go through and read these um, fact sheets to familiarize yourself with the requirements for each of these different types of crops. So um, they're kind of grouped up uh, probably by commodity group. So we got cereal grains, citrus, berries, fruiting vegetables, curcubits, um, oil seed crops, legumes, um, palm fruit, root and tuber vegetables, stone fruit crops, tree nut crops. So, um, and they're available in English and Spanish. Um, Again, these are really, really new. I, I, to be honest, I haven't had a, a chance to fully read through some of these new nicotinoid regulations myself um, because we've been trying to really work on the, the private applicator um, situation that's just really a massive amount that, that our office is going to have to process and try to get everyone certified. Um, but we do want you to be aware that this just came out and these are available to you. Um, the website's there at the top, but again, I'll send a link out to um, all the dealerships on this as well. And then um, I was talking to a dealer, the, um, dealership employee, and so I just wanted to, let me log in here. I just want to show you kind of, um, I had some questions about, um, um, oops, let me finish that. Let me log in real quick. Okay, so just to kind of give you an idea of like um, what things look like on our end. Exit that. Um, I, we have like a, a mock permit that we just play around with for demonstration purposes. So we just call it Fred Farmer. So this is not a real permit. You'll be able to easily tell because it's kind of odd. Um, but this is kind of what our system looks like. And there's tabs. Um, here on the side. So the first page is mostly like general contact information. Um, and then here we're going to list all their affiliated contacts. So that's your dealers, PCAs, pest control businesses, and their certifications. Okay. Um, the, the challenging part is this does print on their permit, but it does not list the end of the, it'll list their license number, but it does not list the categories. Okay. So um you're going to have to probably, as a dealer, figure out a way to vet what categories they have because it won't be something printed on the permit. Okay, um, it will list their license, but it won't. So if it's a DPR license, you could probably easily vet that by going to the DPR um, licensing website and look up their name, make sure the license number matches, and then it'll, it'll list the categories. Uh, for the people with the private applicator cert certifications. You're only going to be able to know if they have that new road vertebrate category probably by looking at their card. Okay. Or you can always contact uh, the ad commissioner's office to, to check that for you. Um, then we'll have the pesticides listed, right? And so um, as far as the aluminum phosphide goes, right, because we're going to have a lot of people that are not going to have the ability to do rodent control um, come the first of the year if they have unless they've taken that new test and passed the boring vertebrate fume again. Uh, so um, aluminum phosphide would be listed here, but we're going to be doing, uh, I talked to Judith this morning, and what we're going to do is we can adjust um, on that permit, um, whether it's something that can be applied by a pest control business only, or a pest control business and the operator. So anyone who's not certified, we're going to change it to pest control business only. What we're also going to be doing, because you're going to need a hard copy, we're going to be going through um, here this next month in, in December, and I, I'm not sure the exact hard date that we're going to request that we have everyone who is certified with the brewing vertebrate fumigant category or has a QAL, a category M or, or whatever, um, that they provide us a copy of that certification unless they received it already from us and we would have that already updated on file. Um, we're going to then amend off. Um, so we'll, we'll be adding an amendment to the permit. We're going to rescan it. And we put it uh, so it'll be available for you to access via CalAg permits with that new amendment attached, showing that um, aluminum phosphide products would only be for pest control business only until that grower updates their certification and then we'll take that amendment out. Okay, um, so you might want to start looking. The hard part is, is if you got a permit already on file for somebody who had a multiple year permit and that permit. Um, 
this aluminum phosphide, right, because it was good until 2020, the end of 2024, and they were previously certified to use it, uh, your old permit's going to have it listed as PCB and operator, right? Um, so you want to look at the date. When we scan permits, um, it'll have a cover sheet usually on it. It has the most recent scan date. Um, so you'll probably want to make sure you have the most recent version of the scan available to you uh, for your records, okay? Um, but you'll, you're, this first few years is going to be a little tricky because um, you may still have an old permit on file and don't realize you have one that's outdated uh, and it may not reflect that they can't possess, like, you know, purchase and um, that aluminum phosphide product, okay? And so my suggestion would be to, to validate also by verifying their, their actual physical card that they have that new category on there. Um, like I said, we're making our road category cards blue, but other counties may not be doing a color distinguishing difference. So the main thing is you want to look for that little check mark that says, yes, they have a burning verbit fumigant certificate. Okay. Um, let me just print, um, do like a, a sample print just because that way you guys see what, uh, what it looks like on your end. Generate PDF. Okay, so again, when you're looking at it, it's gonna look like this, okay? So the front page, a lot of times people just look at the front page up, oh, we got the Stanislaus County permit. When I go and do dealer audits, sometimes all I see is the front page or I see the front page without a signature. Now, if it's a watermarked one from another county that says this is the certified official copy, we accept that, right? That you generated that out of CalAg permits. But if it's just like, you know, maybe someone had an online appointment and we mailed it to them and we asked them to sign it and send it back and they never signed it and it doesn't have the county ag commissioner's ag commissioner signature on it, you should be questioning that that is not a valid permit, okay? Um, I, I do see that occasionally. Or I see the grower, they send you the permit, but they only send the first page, okay? The first page is not the permit. The whole permit is the permit, right? And so you want to make sure you have that along with any amendments that are, are made, okay? And then on the second page here, <clears throat> oops, it's going to list all the contacts. Now it's going to have your guys' probably as um, names as PCAs or dealers listed on there as a contact. It's going to have their pest control businesses listed, and it should have them uh, either as a certified operator or their pest control business number or their P private applicator number or QAL number listed. But unfortunately, it won't, again, list that category. I think that's something that we need to work with. Um, this is CalAg Permits is a statewide program. Um, so we'll, we'll probably be talking to them on figuring out ways to make this a little bit more user-friendly for everybody. And hopefully, we can, we can get something with showing the categories or qualifications listed as well. But currently, that does not exist. Um, then for the individual chemicals, it will be listed, um, again, whether it's who the type of applicators are. If it says PCB, then that means it can only be applied by a pest control business uh, unless it says operator. Or, you know, this may not get amended if they've gotten a new license or category. So don't go just by that. If you have some, so a higher level license that they're presenting, um, then go by that, okay? All right, any questions regarding this? Um, then the individual sites are all listed below. Um, it also says, you know, list sites with school site notifications. My advice um, with school site notifications, I think we're all pretty good at making sure any restricted products get updated and amended um, in a timely manner. But the non-restricted materials also have to be reported. And so if you have new adjuvants or new AIs that you haven't used before with them, um, help them to get their notifications updated. We're starting to see, generally speaking, um, more questions from the general public about things that are happening around schools, especially um, goal. If you can mitigate the need for goal in and around schools, that would be really helpful because unfortunately we then have to go in and um, investigate. Typically they all come back negative um, as far as investigation goes, but what ends up happening is in the process of investigating that, we do usually find out goal was applied somewhere in that area and the school notifications weren't current. And so even though nothing maybe happened to the kids or the school directly, there may be an incidental 
um, violation that spins off of that related to these school notifications. So if you can help your growers that are in and around schools, um, keeping these updated, that, that would be a big help to them. Okay. And then again, um, oops. And then all the sites are, are listed after that, right? So you've got the individual site numbers. Um, so just make sure uh, these are all weird sites because uh, we just make them up Christmas trees and things like that. But um, you'd want to make sure that each one of those um, sites is listed that you're going to be writing a rec for or selling under and that the individual pest sites are listed for those sites. And if not, you should be seeing an amendment um, that then um, adds those, those products or sites onto the permit. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. So with that said, I'm going to be, um, again, sending out those updates, um, the, the, at least those links to some of those um, websites that we went over to you guys, just as a reference for your own staff. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact our office. Uh, as you can see um, on the proposed um, regulations website, there's, there's a lot of changes that are coming out in the next few years. We'll do our best to, you know, kind of help you guys navigate that um, as as these get approved. Um, I encourage you guys to participate in any comment sessions as well, because it's not always the ag industry that that gets um, heard. Sometimes it's other people from the general public, and so um, feel free to participate in those comment periods as they get approved. We'll do our best to try to get that information disseminated to you. Um, they will always be available here on the DPR website as well. Um, we're constantly updating and learning as we read through these as well. So, so be a little patient with us as we try to get caught up as well. Um, but we're here to help support you guys in this process. And we appreciate, I know you guys as dealers really help support us and in, in our processes as well. And so, um, just thank you guys for your time and, uh, feel free to contact us, um, throughout the year as, as needed. All right. And I think with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up this, this, uh, session.